welcome our, uh, those who are viewing uh, this uh, Bible study, and we welcome you. Um, we've already had several requests from different parts of the country for, uh, to Martha for the paperwork. So people are watching the, um, the Bible study, and now they want to have the worksheets. So the worksheets are available. You just need to contact Martha, and she will uh, transmit them to you via the internet electronically. You can have the notes um, from the study, as well as some of the worksheets that are handed out each week. Last week, we um, had a little bit of an introduction uh, on uh, the person of the Apostle Paul. We talked a little bit about his background, uh, so you have a, a little sense of his um, of who he is, the one who is the writer of the text which we are about to look at, which is um, his letter to the church at Rome. One of the things to bear in mind is that, um, that the letter to the Romans that Paul writes is the longest document that he writes. Um, it is a letter uh, that he is sending to um, the church that is in Rome. And um, we don't know who founded the church in Rome. Uh, by the time Paul writes this letter, which we believe was in the uh, um, early to mid 50s of the, of the first century, uh, is when he, when he wrote this. So we're talking about uh, a little better than uh, 20, 25 years after the event of, uh, of Jesus, his passion, his death and his resurrection. Um, so some, some time has passed. Uh, when Paul was writing uh, his letters that are collected in the New Testament, he probably wrote um, many letters that no longer exist. Um, uh, he, he probably wrote a lot of material that are lost to us. So what we have, in all probability, is a small percentage of that correspondence that has survived. Um, and were collected. And thank God, the people who had them in their position, the possession of different individual churches, because he wrote to individual people and individual communities for the most part. And, and, and as he was writing to these communities, um, he was writing to communities that he was the founder of. And this is the way he provided pastoral oversight to the many communities that he had started throughout the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, besides uh, Galatia, St. Paul pretty much was, uh, um, was the uh, successful missionary of what would be known as um, the Greek world, the heart of Greek civilization, and what is now, for the most part, Greece and the um, western shore of, the, um, of what is now Turkey at that time was territories that belonged to uh, ancient Greece. So St. Paul um, wrote letters because there were various occasions that he was addressing. And whenever you read um, the letters of St. Paul in the New Testament, it's like reading uh, somebody else's mail. He, he's not writing to us. I'm sure he, he, he had no idea that his writings would be collected and preserved and that uh, 20 centuries later, there would be a group like us that would be reading over them with keen interest. And that, that he was writing to a particular local group of people, and there were occasions that caused him to write. Usually, they had to do with uh, pastoral concerns or controversies that developed in that local community. Romans is different than that. Romans is the only letter that we uh, have in which um, it is to a church that Paul had nothing to do with their coming into being. And it's lost to history. We do not know who were the first people who, um, who missionized and established the community in Rome. All we know is that the gospel somehow uh, got there from Jerusalem in a very short period of time and was already found in the city of, of Rome. Paul writes to them, because he intends to visit them. That's his desire to visit the church that is in Rome. He wants to do this because the reputation of the Roman church and of their, um, of their of the strength of their community, uh, what Paul calls their faith, 
is becoming renowned throughout the world. So uh, today we have this phenomenon called, phenomenon called super churches, where you get a church that's really a, a growing, happening church and things are going on. Well, Rome was already becoming that in the first century. Uh, certainly the Jerusalem church was that in the early stages, but uh, the Jerusalem church would uh, soon be surpassed by the church in Antioch. Antioch would become a major uh, center of Christianity. And as you know, as I said last week, Antioch was the place where the followers of the way became known as Christians and got the name Christians. So the church in Rome was a flourishing uh, church. It already had a reputation throughout the uh, Christian world at this time. Um, and so Paul intends to visit. Now, bear in mind, Rome is the imperial capital of the empire. All roads lead to Rome. This is a significant city, and to have a Christian presence there within the first generation um, it, it, it is at one time, at, at one and the same time, it's remarkable because it shows you the success of the spreading of the gospel of Jesus was so very early on, right out the gate. And at the same time, it is not surprising because, of course, Rome was the center of everything. So why wouldn't this new religious movement, uh, which early on was considered a, an extension of Judaism, a type of Judaism, why wasn't it showing up in Rome? Of course it would. But um, Paul um, uh, gives us a glimpse as to who some of these people are. The 16th or the last chapter of the Epistle to the Romans, Paul gives personal greetings uh, to people that he knew were in the church at Rome. And um, these were just the ones he happened to know of personally. And it's quite a list that he mentions all of these names. In fact, the 16th chapter of Romans uh, some people skip over it because all it is is Paul yeah. reading all these individuals. But to me, it is the most interesting chapter because he makes usually a comment about this person and this person. And sometimes if you take that list of names and, and, and put it alongside other New Testament documents, you'll see that there's some connection with these names. Bible study? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hello. Oh, hi. I haven't shown up here for like about a year. What's that? I haven't shown up to Bible study for about a year. Oh, yeah, you were in the underground. I remember. Yeah, come on in, pull up the chair. Where? I'll sit like, all over here. Yeah. Yeah. Help us remember your name. Luis. 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 Thank you, Luis. Yes. Glad to have you here. Luis. 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 Yeah, I remember now. Uh, when well, we were yeah, meeting exactly. in the lounge. Yeah, about Matthew. Can we write about Yeah, that's right. That's right. Very good. Well, we have the handouts over there, so we be sure to uh, get a hold of those so you can take them with you. And do you have an email address? I know. Okay. No. Okay. okay. That's no problem. Glad, Louis, glad, glad you're here to join with us. So, um, but um, Paul also, so he wants to come. He's longing to visit. He expresses this to the Romans. And in the 16th chapter, which is the last chapter of the book of Romans, you might want to go ahead and look at that sometime on your own. And you see all of these different names. Of, of, of individuals. And um, so it gives us a glimpse that these are real people living in real time. Um, and these are our ancestors in the faith. And um, so Paul writes to them. What's uh, just a little aside, um, the thing that will strike you when you're reading the 16th chapter of Romans is the number of women who are in prominent places of leadership that are listed there. It's important that. Uh, uh, to be attentive to that because um, uh, that would soon change in the life of the church where women were not permitted to be in leadership roles. But in the very first generation, women were playing a very prominent role. Uh, we have uh, a woman by the name of, um, uh, by the name of uh, Deacon. He, he, no. Maybe. Yeah, we have a woman by the name of, is it Phoebe? I can't remember. Yeah, what well, well, anyway, you hear these different, oh, I know, uh, Junia. Junia. Junia, an who, apostle. Uh, who is called an apostle. So, um, if there's ever an example. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It's clearly a woman's name. But, in later manuscripts, 
and the, and the further away a manuscript uh, is from the source or from the time, then the more questionable it is. The earliest manuscripts preserves the feminine form of the name Junia. In later manuscripts that come in later centuries, it's changed into the masculine Junius. Yes. It sounds like the early church recognized women, the early Christian church. However, yeah. what about Rome? Did Rome re recognize women? The, the Rome in this city or the church in Rome? The Not Christian, but right. the Romans. You know, um, certainly um, women could achieve places of power and influence, but they Roman society was strongly patriarchal. So what a woman could hope to do is to be able to marry well and mar marry into power. And, and so there are powerful women. Um, in, in the New Testament itself, in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul, the first place in Europe that Paul missionizes is a Roman city, a Roman colony. Now, a Roman colony is a city that is directly connected to the city of Rome. And a Roman colony would be Roman people from the city of Rome who would live there. And it was built in a way that was architecturally similar to the city of Rome. And culturally, it was, it was like a little island of Roman culture in, 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 in a foreign land. And, and usually, that's where they would have their military headquartered there, Roman governors were headquartered there. This uh, uh, city was in actually a place in Macedonia called Philippi. You've heard of Philippi, sometimes it's pronounced Philippi, but it's really Philippi. And Philippi is named for, it's a Greek name, named for King Philip, who was the father of Alexander the Great, who was the great Macedonian. But that was three centuries before Jesus. But anyway, this city became and was known as a Roman colony. Well, when Paul preaches the gospel there, there is only one person that is named. And it was a wealthy woman who had her own household and business. So when that women could achieve that. Um, she might have been a widow or she might have been a self-made woman, but she was economically successful. She ranked, she was involved in the dying of fabric. Um, and that was something that was very expensive. Only the well-to-do could buy fabric that were dyed into colors. So she was a wealthy woman, and she's mentioned by name. Her name is Lydia. <laughs> but um, but the, now the question is, why is she named and no one else? Probably because she became the head of the church in Philippi. She was probably the pastor, if you will, or the bishop of Philippi. There would be no other reason to mention her in such prominence. This is why a careful study of the New Testament documents begin to reveal to us that women were not faceless and without identity. There were women there who were named, and if they're named, there's a reason for it. Um, one of the most interesting um, uh, women that is mentioned repeatedly in the Acts of the Apostles, and even mentioned in the, in the uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, is a woman that is either called Prisca or Priscilla. And she and her husband were missionaries, companions with Paul, and they were prominent leaders in the early church. So here was a married couple who had ministerial, a pastoral authority within the church in the first century. And what is even more interesting is that whenever they're mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles or in the Epistles, her name is always mentioned first, which is even more unprecedented because usually women were mentioned after the husband's mentioned, if the woman's name is mentioned at all. And, and, and here we have something that's rather startling because when people think of uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila was her husband, they think of Priscilla first. So I get the feeling that Priscilla was probably the, the one who was the real gifted one in ministry, and, and, and Aquila was like the support minister. <laughs> you know, she was probably the preacher, and he was the guy who uh, stood beside her. So, 
Uh, so when you look at the New Testament, you get a sense that women play much more of a prominent role and that the church was much more egalitarian when it came to gender roles. That would disappear in time. That was really countercultural. That was revolutionary. Could, could it be that the, the people that came to Rome and started the church brought the concept of women? The people that, that started the church in Rome, that, that brought the religion to Rome, could it have been their idea that it was all right for women to be in charge? Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, Who would have that been? yeah, I think the, the Christian movement in general was probably a, a more, at this time, socially radical and more willing to affirm women. Um, but sometimes, um, even in the New Testament, you'll begin to see that the, the, um, that the I, I don't like using this word because it's used in a pejorative way, but patriarchy began to reassert itself. So in the later writings of the New Testament, you begin to see things like women being pushed already within the first century, towards the end of it, there is a, a pushback of women in be, being in such um, places of prominence. Unfortunately, St. Paul is blamed for that. But, um, but when you read the 16th chapter of Romans, you can see that Paul had a great love and respect for women leaders in the church. So it's kind of an unfair criticism of, of, of Paul the Apostle. That in itself would be a great study, wouldn't it? The women of the New Testament. But that's just a, a little parenthetical thing I'm throwing in here. I, I wanted to get back to uh, the uh, Epistle to Rome. Paul also has another thing in mind by writing this Epistle to Rome. He wants to give them um, uh, his understanding of the Gospel of Jesus. So what we have in Romans is the closest thing to a complete systematic explanation of his theology. In the other letters, he's writing because there's pastoral problems, and then you get his theology emerging here and there. So you kind of get bits and pieces in the other epistles. In Romans, he has a sustained thought from the first chapter of Romans all the way to the 15th chapter. It's all one stream of thought that Paul is on. It, 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 it is it is coherent and it's consistent and so we get perhaps the most theological of all of his writings. It's not pastoral like the other letters, um, but it is purely a theological document. Remember I told you before, um, Peter and the other apostles could tell you what happened. The Christ event, they bore witness. Uh, they had their charisma or their proclamation in which they preach. But Paul was uniquely equipped among the early Christian leaders because of his brilliance and his education. He could explain why it happened. So I'd like to say, Peter could tell you what happened. He was there. He could even tell you what Jesus said. Paul could see what the, the, the testimony of the apostles, know the story, learn the story from them, but then he could see the implications and understand what happened. And so he begins to develop. And this is really the birth of something that has been with the Christian religion from the very beginning. It begins really with Paul, what we call theology. Theology is something that uh, it, it is a huge part of the Christian experience. Not all religions have a theology. This is... This is uh, uh, something that is uh, developed by Christians in our, in our faith tradition, but it begins with Paul. So you might say in many ways, Paul's the first Christian theologian. And right up there next to him is John. We just studied John's gospel last year. And you know how theological John uh, is. And John is called St. John the Theologian, or St. John the Divine. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, this is the value of us studying Romans because we're really going to get inside the head as much as we can through a document and of the thinking of Paul. And you're going to see the brilliance of Paul. At times, reading the epistle to the Romans can be intimidating. He packs so much into his writing that it's almost like, I, I'm not, it's, it's hard to just read straight through Romans. It's a struggle. 
You can do it, and I encourage you to do it, but you'll find that, wow, there's just so much here. Yeah, so we're going to spend the next uh, uh, several months unpacking the thought of Paul from the text of Romans. That's, that, that is our desire to do that. So, um, uh, and then finally, what I wanted to say, why Paul wrote to the Romans, and he's giving this presentation at this day, is that Paul has the intention uh, he is now missionized successfully or evangelized the Eastern Mediterranean world, the Greek-speaking world. He has this desire, this passion to take the gospel of Jesus to the Western part of the Mediterranean world, to a place called España or Spain. He wants to do missionary work in Spain. So on the way to Spain, he wants to stop, stop by and visit the church in Rome. And, in all probability, he is probably going to seek support from them financially uh, to be able to do the mission in Spain. So he's giving this presentation to precede him before he comes to Rome. Now, at the time of the writing of this, most scholars believe that he was residing in the city of Corinth, which is in Greece. And he was there for 18 months. We believe that he uh, uh, more than likely was at that location when he wrote the letter. But be before he goes to Ro Rome, he needs to make a stop in Jerusalem. Remember, he took a collection because the Jerusalem church was experiencing financial hardship. There was a famine in that part of the world. And, and so they needed relief. And so what Paul did is got all, took a, a collection from all of the churches he had founded which were mainly Gentile churches, and he takes this huge gift, financial gift back to James in Jerusalem. Now, this was not only a charitable thing to do, but politics are a part of the church, and it was a real smart thing to do because, remember, the church of Jerusalem is overwhelmingly Jewish, it is overwhelmingly conservatively Jewish, and not everyone uh, feels good about the Gentile mission of Paul. So, with, but, by coming with this big financial gift from these Gentiles, these uncircumcised ones. Here, this is where you can tell you can see that Paul is scoring points. Well, when he arrives in Jerusalem, um, he goes to the temple, and of course, Paul has so many enemies. Not only uh, felt some Christians that are enemies, some Jewish believers, but people who were attached to the Sanhedrin. Remember, he was in the employ of the Sanhedrin, and then he becomes a Christian, and that, that was an embarrassment. So he has a lot of enemies, and there's a, a plot to assassinate him. And, uh, but before this uh, action could uh, uh, come to fruition, the Romans become involved, and because Paul is a Roman citizen, they take him under house arrest back to the Roman uh, uh, colony city on the Mediterranean coast called, called Caesarea, where the Roman governor of Judea resided. That's where Pontius Pilate resided, and, and then uh, Festus and Felix were two other governors. And Paul was there for quite some time, and then he uh, ends up having to appeal to Rome, and then he's in chains when he's sent to Rome uh, to appeal to the emperor to hear this case. Then he gets to Rome, According to the record in the Acts of the Apostles, he is greeted. All of these Christians came out to greet Paul as he got off the boat before he even got up, it got into Rome. Uh, and, and he was so his letter worked. You see, it was two years or so after he wrote the letter that he goes to Rome. Um, um, but as he arrives, he's greeted by the Christians of Rome and he's embraced. And, uh, and so uh, he made quite an impression on them through this letter. This is the letter we're going to study. This is a letter that makes so much a difference for uh, believing Christians throughout history. And it certainly got to the Romans. But the Acts of the Apostle ends with Paul under house arrest waiting for uh, the emperor to hear his appeal. And it's like, oh, couldn't you tell us what happened? The story ends there to be continued and we never hear what happens. So we're left in guessing uh, what had happened, but the emperor at that time was Nero, and we know that eventually Paul, by the mid-60s, which would be 10 years after the writing of this letter that we're studying, 
um, was martyred or put to death by Roman execution under the first um, persecution of Christians by the imperial government under the Emperor Nero. Uh, yeah. Why does he change? There was a plot against him. Yeah. Well, the Jewish authorities were making an, uh, an accusation. They, they were bringing charges against Paul against. to the Roman government. And um, they were saying that Paul was a rabble rouser, uh, that he was going to create trouble uh, for the Romans. These were the accusations. Well, um, because he was a Roman citizen, he had to await trial. So what the governor did, because Roman governors, even though they were law-abiding, were also terribly corrupt, they decided to delay the trial. And went on, he was in Caesarea for a couple of years because it was their hope that Paul would pay them a bribe. You see, Paul didn't do that. So Paul was awaiting trial. The governors are postponing the trial and, and hoping to collect a bribe from Paul and his followers. It never came. So Paul, in the final, at the final moment, knew his rights as a citizen of Rome. Remember, you could be a part of the Roman Empire and not be a citizen. It's not like American citizenship. You had to be a citizen of the city of Rome. Paul had that. Um, and so uh, Paul had his rights, and he makes an appeal to Rome. That gets him out of Caesarea, but he's still in chains awaiting trial because these charges were brought against him. Yeah, you might say that. And that could have been what had happened, and he never made it to Spain. But in the next generation, there's a man who was a leader in the Church of Rome by the name of Clement. And Clement, in his letter, asserts that Paul did come to Rome. Uh, he was acquitted. He did go to uh, Spain and did missionary work, and then came back and was rearrested under the uh, persecution by, uh, by Nero and was executed at that time. But we can't verify that. Yeah, yeah you had a question? Was, um, when Paul was in Caesarea, then he, um, was he in prison during those about two years? What you would call house arrest? House arrest. I mean, he wasn't languishing in a dungeon. They treated him well. Because oh, they had to because he was a Roman citizen. Oh, that's when you mentioned he was in house arrest? Oh, and like earlier you mentioned he was in house arrest? Oh, was he in house arrest also in Rome? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, so he was in house arrest the whole time oh. from Caesarea for, for several years. Yeah. <laughs> at least a couple of years. So it sounded like that there were two times that he was under arrest. He, yeah, he was, he was acquitted and then back again? That's, that's what Clement tells us. Okay. Clement tells us that Paul was acquitted in Rome. The appeal went through, he got acquitted, and then he went on and did some But these are things that are, un un other than Clement saying that, we don't have any other information. So we can't say with absolute certainty, because what if Clement got that wrong? We don't know. So that, that's pretty much the story of, of, of this apostle. And now, um, as we look at the text here of Rome, of Romans chapter. But I remember sitting on 30 on Wednesday? 7. 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock. Thank you. Goodbye. God bless you. Come back again. Thank you. Yeah. You never know. Okay. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. There's a first, uh, first uh, if you look at the handouts, um, do, you, do you have all, everyone have their handouts? John, let me give you your handouts. I'll get over it. Right over here. Now, For John Dean, these are the handouts I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, um, I think that um, it, it, as you can see, I give you the text of the first chapter of Romans, um, which is my own translation. So, and I'll be providing these every time we move from chapter to chapter, so that it be useful for you. Then, from chapter to chapter, 
I'm going to give you a glossary. You see the glossary handout? I just want you to be familiar with the handouts. Um, this is my attempt to, um, to take the key words of this chapter and give you an expanded definition of those words. This is going to help you unpack Paul's thought here because it's just too dense um, for us not to do that. So, um, so I hope that uh, you will find this approach to be um, helpful to you as you, uh, as you pursue this study of Romans and you'll be referring to this glossary and I have, I, I have developed them for every chapter in, in Romans. Um, then I have here a, a, something called natural revelation um, in which um, I will, we, we will talk about that at this point, probably not tonight, but we will talk about that at this point. That, that, that is an important theological concept, natural revelation, and that's a document you have there. Um, because um, Paul introduces us to this concept in the first chapter, verses 18 to 20. Basically what Paul is saying is that all human beings are without excuse because um, the truth about God is somehow evident in creation. Uh, so this idea that we can learn something about the divine glory or the divine life through um, nature is what they call natural revelation. And I show you where Paul is dependent. Remember, he was an educated rabbi. Where did he get this idea? Well, the Book of Wisdom, which is in the Catholic Bible, but not in the Protestant Bible. But Paul obviously is familiar with the Book of Wisdom because that is where the concept originated, about 100 years before Paul. Okay. Then you have this paper, which is... Uh, going to be a worksheet we're going to use. And I hope to get to this tonight. This is really important. And I'll explain what this means a little later. But it's extremely important that we have a sense of, uh, of the structure of Paul's theological thinking. And this is an attempt to do that. So we'll be going over that in just a moment. Um, I, I, I'll send it to you. Okay. Yeah, I'll, is that what you need for the notes? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'll get that to you. And then I have this Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And I'll, now, I'm going to call your attention to that, that page. Chapter 5, verse 12 is pivotal. Pivotal. Can you say Pivotal. 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 Yes. This is, in my mind, one of the most important verses in the epistle to the Romans. And from there, the thought of Paul just unfolds beautifully. It's right in the center of the, uh, of the epistle. And, um, and, one of the things about this uh, uh, verse is that it was mistranslated. One word was mistranslated. When the, Paul wrote the epistle, he wrote it in Greek. Do you see the Greek up there? That's the Greek text right there. Uh, Romans 5.12. <clears throat> then, below that, you have... Jerome's Latin translation. Now, I don't read Latin, but, um, but, um, but I pursued this translation. The Latin translation was made in the late 4th century, early 5th century. Why is this important to us? Because Jerome mistranslated by not translating a very small word. As a result of that, there has been introduced into anyone who was dependent upon the Latin text a misunderstanding of Paul from the get-go. And the great theologian that has been the father of, really in many ways, the great theological giant that has informed 
Latin theology, Roman Catholic theology, and Protestant theology. His name is Augustine. Basically, both Catholics and Protestants are from the Latin tradition. And both Catholics and Protestants <clears throat> look to Augustine as an authority. And this is going to be something that I think might interest you. Uh, does anyone remember their catechism about baptism? No. Yeah. What does baptism do? Anyone remember? Especially if you were raised originally. Well, what? Takes away original sin. Original sin. Original sin. Remove original sin. Jim, you need something from me? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you have this idea of original sin. Augustine came up with this concept of original sin. And he came up with it and he builds the whole doctrine of original sin on Romans 5.12, but a mistranslation of Romans 5.12. You see, Augustine, as brilliant as he was, and I love his book, The Confessions, and he was brilliant, um, didn't read Greek. So Jerome mistranslates it. And Augustine builds his theological scheme, which we call original sin, upon a mistranslation. Um, now, before I get any more words, yeah. you yeah. said that this is Jerome's translation. Yeah, the Latin. And he's translating the from Greek. Augustine? Yeah, no. Yeah, I'll do it here. Here's what Paul wrote. See there at the top? <laughs> Not the, the, it's in Greek. There's a certain beauty to the Greek alphabet, but anyway, that's Greek. That's how Paul wrote it. Jerome uh, translates it into this Latin. Then we have, in the English-speaking world, we have the Roman Catholic translation of the Latin Vulgate into English. Do they correct the error? No. They're still depend they're dependent on the Latin text. So it's correctly rendered into English in the Dewey Rings, which was the Roman Catholic translation um, uh, that was, I, I got it from the uh, 1899. Uh, some of you might remember the Dewey Rings before, pre it was the tr translation used before Vatican II, before there was the New American Bible. <clears throat> uh, so the mistranslation is perpetuated into the English language if you're translating from the Latin text. Now, the Protestants, the Church of England, the authorized version, also did a translation much earlier in 1611. It's called the King James Bible. The King James Bible is a wonderful translation. It's beautiful in, in English, and they used what be, the best manuscripts they had available. Unfortunately, at that time, they didn't have the kind of manuscripts that we now have, that we've been able to discover since then. So it's, it, it, people do not use the same manuscripts, of, and, and one of the manuscripts that they used was the Latin manuscript. So in the English translation called the King James Version of this verse, again, it's mistranslated. Uh, again, in the Revised Standard Version, which was the, uh, the next big English tra uh, translation after the King James in 1952, it's still even though that goes to the best Greek text, it still doesn't give a clear rendering of Paul's uh, text up at the top of the page. And the same is true with the New American Bible of 1970, which is now the official Roman Catholic version. Yes? And do you have any questions about this so far? No, I still don't have any Augustine. Okay, here's Augustine. Augustine is reading the Vulgate in Latin. Jerome, okay. Okay. Jerome translated. It's a bad translation. And Paul, uh, Augustine, then in his developing his theological thought, thinks that he's he's uh, building it upon a good translation. He in fact is not, and he did not have the ability to verify that with the Greek text. As a result. Augustine comes up with this idea, original sin, 
Nowhere in the New Testament is there anything about original sin. It is an Augustinian idea based upon his reading of a text that was mistranslated. So Augustine put it into English. No, he didn't know English. English didn't exist at that time. Augustine is using the Latin text. So he's re... He's reading the Latin text. He's not a translator. He's reading Jerome's Latin. He's reading the Jerome, and he develops the doctrine of original sin, which I'm going to show you how he comes to this, okay. um, uh, based upon an erroneous translation. And again, he puts it into Latin. Right. Yeah. And then he puts it into English. Yes, much later, because English didn't exist at this time. So, I, I, I hope this is not too tedious for you. Uh, but it's really it's really important because the question is the question is the big question in the letter to Romans is how are we saved? I mean, it's all about salvation. The letter to the Romans. How is it that we're saved? What is the problem that we need to be saved what from? Why do we even need salvation? That, that's the real question of Romans. St. Paul, oh, that's St. Paul, St. Augustine, based upon Romans 5.12, comes up with an answer to that question. We need to be saved from sin. The big problem in the human race is the problem of sin. And because we sin, we die. The reason we are mortal is because we sin. And everybody sins, according to Augustine. This is a very pessimistic view. Yes? You know, that takes us then back to Adam and Eve. Exactly. Yeah, that's where the original sin came from. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Augustine had this idea based upon Romans uh, 512, and I'll show you in a moment how he came to that. Um, he had this idea that what happened in the Garden of, in the garden of, of, Eden, of Eden is that Adam sent, or Adam and Eve sent. You know the story. And that the guilt of their sin and the consequence of their sin is inherited and passed on to the children. This is called original sin. But the original sin that Adam and Eve committed was concupiscence. You know what that is? Carnal knowledge, sex. So human sexuality is where um, the original sin resides. And so that story in the garden about the snake and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Now, and the fruit and all that. This is symbolic language talking about the temptation of sexuality. Augustine had a very negative view of human sexuality. And in his mind, human sexuality explains the whole problem of human sin. You know what? What's that? Why did Augustine have trouble with it? Well, you know, let me put it this way. He was twisted. <laughs> Augustine, yeah, well. Augustine had a problem with sex. I'll yeah. put it this way. Augustine, as a young man, loved women. He, he, you know, he was a young scholar, um, he was a good-looking guy, and he just womanized, I mean, you know, he just couldn't get enough women. So, yeah, yeah, he was that. And then he took up with a girl, a woman, he didn't even bother to marry her, and he had a child out of wedlock. He had a saintly mother who was a Christian, St. Monica, and she was always praying for a little boy, Augustine, because he, he, he was, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, in that way. Promiscuity was his personal hang-up. So then he is converted to Christianity by reading Romans, basically. And it totally transforms his life. And that story of his conversion, he records for us in perhaps one of the greatest spiritual autobiographies that were ever written called The Confessions of St. Augustine. I highly recommend it. I love the book. But what does Paul, what does Augustine do when he becomes a Christian? 
He renounces the life of sin. How does he think of what the sinful life is? Promiscuity. What does he do with his live-in girlfriend and his son? He dumps her. No, he keeps the son. He gets rid of her. Sends her on. You know, what, what, what? because, you know, he associates her with his promiscuity. And so a man who loved sex, now through his religious conversion, blames all of his spiritual problems upon sex. Sex is the big problem. And Adam and Eve's original sin was carnal knowledge. It was sexual. And it, it, this is according to Augustine. And so original sin, the guilt and everything, is passed on from Adam and Eve to all of the, it's like a genetic disease. It's getting passed on. Baptism is what cleanses your soul from this original sin, this original guilt. Not only that, but Augustine came up with this idea that all of us, as descendants of Adam and Eve, participated in that sin and sharing that guilt because we were in the loins of Adam. You see? Adam, Adam's the head of... Now, this was very appealing at this period in history. Um, but this is the idea. And so baptism became understood as that bathing, that washing, that purification rite that removes original sin. So that the reason why human beings are mortal, why we die, is because we are all guilty of sin. Not only the sins I commit in this life, but we are somehow complicit in the sin of Adam and Eve. What this leads to is a very pessimistic and legalistic theology. It's pessimistic because, um, it, 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 because it looks at human nature in a very negative way. It looks at human sexuality as being inherently evil and sinful. And, um, and not only that, but the reason we are mortal and the reason we die is because we deserve it. We are all guilty. I'm going to say we all like sex. Yes, and because we all like sex is evidence that we are guilty. So, so, <laughs> so what we have here is we have Adam, the head of the human race. Are you flushing my bed? You didn't know it got so exciting when the Bible study. Theology of Augustine, based upon his misreading of Paul, is Adam sins, we all sin in Adam. Adam dies, and we all become mortal, and we all die. Now. So we're all suffering because of this. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> now, let's, let's, let's skip down to um, the Dewey Reams. Got that Dewey Reams translation? This is a translation from the Latin. Of, uh, 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 of Paul's writing here in this critical verse. Wherefore, as by one man, who is that? Yeah. Adam. Sin entered into this world. And by sin, death. So death comes as a result of sin. You know the story. The day you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Or you will die or you will super die. And so, because of that, death passed upon all men. Now, I know it's in the masculine men, but, but, but this is used in the inclusive sense of all humanity. In whom all have sinned. 
In other words, we all sin right along with that, in the loins of that. Do you see how that Augustinian idea is coming through here? But it's Paul writing. Isn't that what Paul's saying? Let's skip to the uh, King James Version. This is the big Protestant version in the English-speaking world. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, okay, and death by sin. Exact translation is as the Dewey reads. And so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. For that all have sinned. Because we've all sinned in Adam. It seems like that's what is being said here. Go down to the New American Bible that we hear in liturgy. Therefore, just as through one person sin entered the world, notice the inclusive language, one person, and through sin, death, and thus death came to all, inasmuch as all sinned. It seems to be saying that not only did Adam cause sin to come into the world, but we all caused it to happen in Adam. This is the whole doctrine of original sin is built on this. Now, my translation, and I, and I feel like, who am I? Who, who am I? Who am I to be putting myself up against these great translations, which, by the way, I love. But in this particular verse, they are gravely mistaken. And so, just as the sin, it has a definite article in the Greek, entered the world through one person, I do like that, and through the sin, whatever that was, the death, hafanatos, so the death diffused to all human persons, because of which, the death, all human persons have sinned. How did I arrive at that? Because, up here in the green text, is this fun for you? Yeah. yeah. Okay, up here in the green text, you see that in the second line, it says F, or no, it, it, there's like, the thing looks like an E, that, that, this, these two, there's two words here. You see the one that looks like this? Okay. It looks like this. This is Omega. You see that? This can be translated because. F, translated because. This one letter word is a relative pronoun. What is a relative pronoun? A relative pronoun is in place of the noun that has been referred to in the immediate, in the immediate phrase. Okay? This word here, ho, I'm pronouncing it, it's pronounced, say that, ho, is pointing back to another noun in the neuter, gender, in the previous phrase. So it's saying because of which. Is it referring to sin or to Adam? No. It's referring to the word ha thanatos, death. That's what it's referring to. So what Paul is actually saying is, it is death that we inherit from Adam. And because we are dead, we are in a state of death, we sin. Okay. Yeah. Augustine says we sin because we participated in Adam's sin. So we're already guilty and we continue to sin and we, and we die because we sin. We sin. What Paul is actually saying, and this is the, grand, the grammar, the grammatical structure of this thing, what Paul is really saying is that what we inherit from Adam is not sin or original sin. We inherit a condition called death. In other words, we're born mortal and it's not our fault. We bear no responsibility. We were born mortal because
because what we actually inherited from Adam and Eve is mortality, death. And because we are in a state of death, the death reigns over us. Because we are mortal, we sin. So the cause of, uh, 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 of sin, our sins is the fact that we are mortal. That's what we inherited from Adam, is our mortality. So we do not die because we deserve it, because we commit sins. We are already dead in Paul's thinking. We live in the realm of death, the realm which is dominated by death. Paul uses the phrase, and death reigned. The kingdom of death, the rule of death. So we're going to die anyway. Yeah. And because, because we're mortal, we sin. So it looks like this. You see this page? Okay.
When you forgive someone, you're removing their guilt and you are going to treat them as if they had never committed that offense against you. But who pays the price for that? When you forgive someone, who, who's, who, who's paying the price? You are. You are forgiving someone. You're taking the burden off of them of the offense. And you're saying, I forgive you. I'm not going to hold it against you. And But now, I, when, I, when, I, when I forgive someone, I mean, I'm talking about serious stuff. When, 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 when I forgive someone, I'm saying, I will carry the pain. You don't have to carry the pain of your offense. I will carry your pain. When God forgives humanity, what God is doing is, I'll take the pain. The pain of God. We worship a God who suffers. That is what the crucifixion is. God taking on the pain that we as human beings cause. That's the central. What's that? That is the central thing of the passion of Christ. Exactly. That he stands in the garden and says, I will take it all off me. Yeah. I will become sin and suffering itself. And this is not something limited to that moment in history, even though that's when it broke into history and that was the event. Here's the significant thing. We will see the resurrected Christ as they saw him centuries ago. But he still bears the wounds. In other words, Christ, who is the Son of God, who is one with the Father, God for eternity will carry the pain of our sins. That's true forgiveness. Because the pain goes somewhere. God is taking the pain. That's Paul's thought. It's, it's hard because we think in typical cause and effect, legalistic ways that if I can please God, or I can do this, um, or somehow um, I can affect my own salvation, you can't. In Paul's mind, you cannot affect your own salvation. It is entirely a work of God. And Paul, and we'll get into this next week, Paul has a key phrase for this. He calls it the righteousness of God. Now, a Christian legalist will think in terms of the righteousness of God. That's the moral purity of God. That is a ridiculous thing to say. Because God is the standard of morality. So it, God is not holding himself up to a standard of morality and saying, I'm morally righteous. I'm the standard of righteousness. Do you see? I am righteousness itself. Yeah, I am the embodiment of righteousness. So what is the righteousness of God that Paul, Paul's talking about? It is God acting to save us from ourselves. That's what's going on. A purposeful decision of love. Yes. Um, so then Paul will develop in the letter different aspects of this overall thing, which we call salvation or justification. Remember, it means the same thing. So when Paul talks about death, he uses the word reconciliation. We are brought from death into, this is when we get in Christ, the first thing we get is eternal life. We get life, zoe, spiritual life. That's what we get into Christ. Because death and life are always understood by the biblical writers and certainly by Paul in terms of relationship. It's always relational in the human mind, or in, the, in the Hebrew mind. So that, oftentimes in Hebrew, a word for death is to be cut off. Death is understood as the ending of a relationship. You are cut off from the land of the living. You are cut off from the tribe. You are cut off from the community. You are dead. In fact, Orthodox Jews, if, you, if, you, if their child converts to Christianity or Islam or some other religion, they have a funeral. You're dead to them. The relationship is over? Yeah. Oh, but Christians do the same. For other reasons. You're dead? Don't ever talk to me again. You're dead to me. Okay? You see? Shani, that kind of thing. That's death. So death in the Bible, and particularly in Paul's writing, must be understood in terms of a relationship. 
How is it that we're dead in Adam? We're alienated, separated from communion with God. We no longer have a relationship with God. Yet, the good news is that God pursues us nonetheless. So, we are reconciled, which is a relational word, right, uh, Bill? We use that word about reconciliation. It's about persons coming to peace with one another. It is relational, so that we who no longer know did not have a relationship with God because we were in under the dom dom domination of death are reconciled, and now we have a relationship with God, and that's called life. Now that we are alive to God, something radically changes with our relationship with that which is called sin. Paul uses another word, redemption. Redemption. Because sin is a slave master. We sin because we're dead. And the most basic sin of all is fear. And, um, and so all the particular sins come out of the fact that we're alienated from God. And sin is a slave master. In Paul's thought, sin is basically idolatry. That's what sin is. Because we are creatures that are in need to worship something greater than ourselves. But since we don't have the true God, the creator God, we make everything else we can find into a potential God, an idol. And that leads us to all the vices in Paul's thinking. You'll see this in Romans chapter 1. So we are redeemed in Christ, we are redeemed from sin, and we are brought into a state of righteousness. But it's a righteousness of faith. Did I spell that right? No, but you and the other little backwards. Thank you. I tried to impress you with my knowledge of Greek and I can't even spell English. Okay. So um that somehow that doesn't look right, but it's okay. Yeah, okay. So Sin became our slave master, now righteousness. We become righteous because we're alive to God. Now there is something placed within our hearts, a deep yearning and a deep desire to please God. Righteousness. And the best way to please God is, what is you, know, you know what righteousness is to God? Not keeping all the rules, although that's nice. That, that, that's the fruit. What is this righteousness I speak of? It is a word called faith, but a better translation is our word trust. Yes. You see, what makes you righteous is that you put your trust in God. And the evidence that you put your trust in God is all of a sudden there is moral improvement in your life. But you don't try to work on your self-improvement apart from faith. Faith and trust in God comes first. He gives you the power to live like Christ. Is this helpful? Yeah. This helpful? And then there's this thing called wrath. And that's scary stuff because it's like fee fi fo fun. What is wrath? Wrath is God's no to sin. That's right. No. No. Wrath is not, we think of wrath as being yeah. God's anger, you know, God gets upset. But the reality is, God's wrath is a manifestation of love because love cannot stand to be in the presence of injustice and not act. Right? Love is not some sort of uh, weak, it's all okay kind of thing. Love always is the antithesis of injustice. And so, wrath is God's love saying no to sin. In other words, sin's not gonna go on forever. God's gonna deal with it. Gonna eliminate it. Has to. Now, I've gone over five minutes. That's right. But, um, <laughs> So then, I'm going to add, just to complete this 
outline that I have up here so far. So Paul speaks of, we are all under the wrath of God, God's no to sin, but because we're in Christ, we have been reconciled, we have been redeemed, and there's this word that Paul uses, propitiation. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. Propitiation is the means by which we are no longer under God's wrath or no, but we now have peace. It's peace with God, or as you know the word, shalom. Well-being. This is just a part of the structure of Paul, which will unfold in the Epistle of the Romans. Um, any thoughts or questions? Well, does this, is this helpful? Uh, <laughs> uh, don't leave it, don't leave it. Ah. Yeah. So, to conclude for you, um, and our thought tonight is that God has done a wonderful thing for the human race in sending Jesus to come among us. And the whole reason that Jesus came is that we might have life um, sin is a problem, but it's not the basic problem. Not knowing and having communion and a relationship with God, that's the problem. Christ has opened the way by which we can have a relationship with God, that we can be moved from the realm of death into the realm of life. Relationship with God. When we have that relationship with God, then we have the ability to overcome the particular sins in our lives. And this is what Paul is trying to tell the Roman Christians. And this is something that will revolutionize your own spiritual life. We shouldn't be afraid of death because we're going to be reborn. That's not exactly right. Death is, this should be welcoming death because you're going to be reborn. Yeah. Remember, in Paul's thinking, we are being saved from the inside out. It begins inside us. But what has been planted in our hearts are the seeds of immortality. Yes, we, in this, this mortal body, will die. But not permanently. It is like a seed planted in the ground. And what is planted in mortality will be raised in immortality. That the life that we have begins first with a with the change of heart. Spiritual life is imparted to us. We have Christ in us. We are spiritually alive on the inside. The day will come when even our bodies will be redeemed. That's called the resurrection. And we participate in the resurrection of Christ. So, there's no need to fear death. No. We have no need to fear death. And this body will die, but it will be raised to new and indestructible life. That is the resurrection. Now, we're going to develop all of these themes and these words as we continue to pursue Romans, but it's going to turn most of our thinking on its head as we do so. And then you're going to be, at some point, like tonight, you're going to be amazed at the thought of this man that we know as the Apostle Paul. Okay? All good. Baptism is not about 
the removal of original sin. It's about the impartation of the Holy Spirit in life. That's what it's about. And, and in that way, it plants the seed of life in the child that works against the mortality and the death that is there as a result of being a part of Adam's race. But it's, in, it's the impartation of grace. It's not the removal of original sin. That was never in the thought of Paul. Yeah, if you ask anybody on the street, what are they going to say? Yeah. 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 The Protestant yeah. Catholic, they'll say it's for the removal of original it. sin. Um, what's most interesting that will bear this out, and this was very helpful for me when I studied Greek Orthodox theology, is that the Greeks, you ask them, you know what original sin is? I said, you never heard of it. Yet they practice baptism. But they have no concept of original sin because it's not in the Greek Bible. The whole emphasis is that we are given life through the sacraments. We're given life, the life of Christ. We should, in fact, when we baptize someone, we're actually giving them a death sentence. They're dying with Christ in order that they may be raised to new life in Christ. So baptism is about the impartation of life. It is a distortion of Paul's thought to say that its primary purpose is for the removal of original sin, which is causes unending grief. In uh, Western Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant. Okay, well, I, I've really gone over time, and I apologize for this. Oh, oh, uh, but uh, thank you. Candy for Patrick, for Jim, for all different kinds of healing. For my brother Richard, whose symptoms of Parkinson's are becoming more and more obvious. For all those that we hold in our hearts, loving God, we lift up these beautiful people. And we know that you love them more than we could possibly love them. And we ask you to extend the grace of your healing to each other. Send forth your Holy Spirit to bring them comfort and hope. We offer this prayer as we now pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive 
those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We belong to you, O Lord. 